Well, welcome everyone to another RIS interview where we bring you the story behind the cutting edge research that made it into our journal, the Review of International Studies, or more commonly known as RIS. Um, today I'm delighted to be talking to Christine Aegis, who is an Associate Professor in Politics and IR at the Swinburne University of Technology in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Um, Christine has an article in the Review of International Studies on This Is Not Who We Are, Gendered Bordering Practices, Ontology in Security and the Lines of Continuity under the Trump Presidency. Uh, welcome, Christine, and congratulations on your article. Thanks, Juliet. I can't quite believe I managed to get an article in the Riz. I've been reading it since I was a postgrad student, so it's very exciting. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, no, congratulations. Um, I thought we'd get straight on to it and, and start asking you um, a few questions. So um, let me start. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your academic journey, how you ended up um, becoming interested in this area of research. Thanks. Um, well, yes, it's sort of this article sort of combines a lot of um, different sort of conceptual, I guess, sort of interests of mine that have been sort of bubbling for a number of years. So I've been researching gender and security for some time. And this article brings together a number of themes that I've been working on, namely probably about two or three themes. The first is ontological security, which I think many of uh, Riz's readership will probably know about, but in a nutshell, it's concerned with the security of being or the security of the self. So ontological security is about surety of the self, and that entails a sense of biographical continuity or, se or self-narrative. So it's the story we tell about ourselves that provides consistency, stabilizes relationships, and sees aberrations to the idea of self as a form of insecurity a lot of the time. But then I'm also interested in what, what I broadly called gendered bordering practices in the realm of critical border studies. And this is the idea that bordering practices uh, perform sovereignty, space, ideas of self and identity. They're not simply passive lines on a map, but they're rather they're imbued with meaning. They take different forms and logics. So building on this, when I talk about a gendered idea about bordering practices, I'm building on work I've done uh, first of all, in a co-authored book with my uh, colleague Lucy Nicholas, which was on the persistence of global masculinism. And in that, we develop out a particular idea of masculinism. And that was then further applied in uh, another piece that I wrote with Emil Edenborg in Sweden, uh, looking at um, applying that idea to Swedish and Russian bordering practices. And more recently, with my colleagues in Sweden, again, uh, Katarina Schinval and Annika bergman Rosamond in our work on far-right populism, gender and ontological security in the context of COVID and climate change. So the article started off as an idea for a, a, an ontological security workshop, and it's changed quite a lot. I had a really ambitious idea to sort of go into a discussion about how ontological security itself is inherently gendered. And that my, my lovely kind ontological security colleagues um, sort of said, well, that's a bit of a big project and you might want to rethink that. Uh, so I started thinking, okay, well, where do we see, for instance, gender and ontological security? What form does it take? What logics underscore it? And this Trump presidency offered up obviously a rich and really obvious case study through which to bring these themes together. And at first glance, gender is quite an obvious part of how Trump saw himself in the US. This is a president, for instance, known for an extremely problematic view of women who aligned with groups and interests that sought to control women's bodies and enacted policies that had a hugely detrimental effect on women. So in some senses, Trump was a caricature and I didn't want to just write about the examples of all the times he presented himself as a horrendous human being he did quite a good job of that himself so aside from this I wanted to look to the places where we probably wouldn't ordinarily find um, or look to expect to find how ontological insecurity is being structured by gendered logics logics such as masculinism 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 as well so I want to look at how ontological insecurity was structured along these gendered lines of division in these places that we wouldn't ordinarily find them. And while he lost the 2020 election, it's important to note that over 74 million Americans still voted for him and he's still looking to make a comeback in 2024. So I don't view Trump as an anomaly or a blip. And part of my concern was what does this mean for international relations and how we understand security? And th that is the part in the lead up to the article. So I basically, you know, 
take at the start of the article, Biden speaking of a return to, to normal politics, a healing of America. Um, but the 2020 election still signaled trouble spots for me. Um, and I think what I wanted to do was complicate or understand this very complicated picture in gendered and ontological security terms. So taking the article, what would be the sort of main arguments and ideas within it? Well, in a way, I sort of start the article off in the present with, with Biden's sort of presidential victory speech, where he talks about bringing the nation together after four tumultuous years of division under Trump. So ontological security was an obvious framework to, to, to start with there too. You know, during the four years we saw Democrats constantly saying America under Trump was not who we are. This, we heard this sort of reflection everywhere in media, by politicians, by, you know, famous people saying, this is not the America I know. And this unsettling of the na national narrative was having a profound political effect. So, for instance, psychologists were reporting, you know, high levels of anxiety amongst voters, all for very different reasons as well. So Democrats were anxious about the implications of the Trump presidency around 2016. And there was also dissatisfaction as well, anger, sort of real sort of emotional sort of tumult on those who were supporting Trump as, at the same time as well. So Trump enters the scene, promises to make America great again. And in some senses, it's trying to operationalize this sense of ontological security. And how we promised to do this was through bordering practices. So at their essence, borders keep out and protect, and they're not meant to be part of a national self-narrative about how individuals understand their own sense of ontological security. So we see this in obvious cases as well. He made a, you know, a major part of his election platform was that material sense of the border, building the wall with Mexico, for instance, reasserting, for instance, American pride and primacy in global affairs, but it was also ideational. And this is in terms of, for instance, who are real or authentic citizens? How do they enact their practices of ontological security and who belongs to the nation? And at that point, I turned to critical border studies because I thought, the borders and the boundary making practices that Trump was talking about worked alongside the ideas of ontological insecurity that he was promulgating when he was going out electioneering and campaigning as well. So if ontological security argued is one of the big points of the article is centered around self narratives, then bordering practices play a key role in authoring that story. And that act of authoring is overlaid with issues of power, but it's also highly gendered. So what I wanted to do was bring gender into this more because I think without that, you just simply have these sort of policy implications and effects without really understanding the logics that are underlying it as well. I think identity can only take us so far in this regard. And I think we need to sort of look to what structures those particular stories as well. And when we talk about gender, I think, when it comes to Trump, we're always fixated on that embodiment of him being the alpha male, displaying a certain idea of masculinity. And I wanted to sort of turn this to a, a more subtle form um, of or account of gender, which involved, for instance, I guess, looking at those places where we wouldn't normally find or expect to find the logics of gender at play. And for me, masculinism was useful because it helped to account for those visible displays of masculinity, but also the, you know, the, the subtle differences where we may be talking, for instance, about a policy area that may not have an obviously gendered angle to it, but is guided by gendered logics. So Lucy, uh, Nicholas and I described masculinism as a sort of an ethos or an ethic that privileges certain voices and silences others and excludes those particular options here too. So we differentiate between masculinism and masculinity in this, sense, in this sense here too. They're both connected, but the idea I wanted to work with in the article was masculinism because it could help explain, for example, why around 50% of white American women voted for Trump and why similar numbers of male and female voters thought just around 2016, that America had become too soft and feminine, for instance, and how Trump himself was also subjected to very gendered critique. So an example of this is an obvious one where he sided with Putin in Helsinki over um, US intelligence agencies on questions of Russians, Russia's interference in the 2016 election. And 
media sort of wrote him up as being a puppet to Putin, a submissive to him. And this is a really gendered sort of display. So we wanted to sort of, I wanted to sort of look at this in terms of where we see this as well. And in the article, I sort of divide this up in some ways, which I really didn't want to, because I don't necessarily want to do a binary between domestic politics and external politics, because the two are so intricately linked. But if I want to call it externally, it was about the war with Mexico, domination of in foreign policy of America sort of, you know, um, regaining its sense of self. And, you know, Trump portrayed America as being humiliated on the world stage, you know, through NATO, through free trade agreements. When it comes to the border as well, you know, Trump invoked all sorts of different analogies of rape as well, that, you know, bad people are going to come across the border and rape women, rape good American women, for instance. Um, even in, you know, global terms, in terms of trade and in terms of foreign policy, he used these rape analogies as well. Um, so there was a really sort of strong logic and connection there, which sort of justified this really different turn in US policy too. At the same time as well, he used gender in a really interesting way. So for instance, the Syrian airstrikes, when you know, it was reported that uh, chemical weapons were used and all these what he called beautiful babies were being sort of killed or injured. He sort of positioned his actions around that in contrast to Obama. Obama, he said, was impotent and weak on Syria. He said that there, was, there would be a red line to cross and he didn't end up crossing it. Um, but when he did the strikes on Syria, the media immediately sort of talked this up as the moment he became the president. So again, this line, this interesting line between masculinism and an embodied idea of the president as masculine and protector of, of the nation or unfortunate others, he's found his purpose. Um, very much so in the same way here that when we turn to what the domestic realm as well, we start seeing Trump supporters or the people, you know, taking part in enacting their own sense of ontological security to their own bordering practices as well. We see the Karen phenomenon, for instance, the desire to restore order and hierarchy is knitted through US history in terms of vigilantism, protecting the border. So you have private citizens at the US border, taking it upon themselves to sort of guard that border and that space to exclude unwanted bodies. We also see it in the displays of the far, of far right supremacy um, in Charlottesville, where there's efforts to sort of regain an imagined lost past that's going on there too. So in a number of different analyses, we start seeing how individual citizens are starting to enact this sense of um, ontological insecurity or security there too. So we start seeing this or calling this for all the Trump years as an aberration. But when you examine this, I think, through a gender lens, what we start finding is that there are lines of continuity and legacies that pre-exist Trump. And in the article, I limit this largely to an analysis of Obama, largely because he pitched himself so obviously in opposition to Obama. But in Obama, we also had a display of masculinity going on there too. Emma Cannon, for instance, described Obama as presenting a, what she calls a hybrid masculinity, disrupting the roles or norms of white male leadership. And also, you know, going back further, if we want to sort of take another step back, during the 2007 Democratic presidential nomination race, Clinton portrayed herself as a much stronger, more capable leader compared to Obama, who was not willing to use nuclear weapons against terrorists. So there's a really, you know, there's an ongoing thread of how gender sort of um, infiltrates ideas about what it means to be a leader, what it means to protect the nation, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time as well, Obama also still relied on these logics of protection, this whole idea that Iris Marion Young talks about, which is an idea that Lucy and I use in that book, is this logic of protection in the international realm. We can see this under the US drone program. So Obama was logic guided by a particular logic of protection that was aligned with his particular view of what America was in the world, this liberal, just actor doing the right thing in terms of securing the nation and the world against, you know, terrorist forces too. Similarly, when Obama um, managed to kill bin Laden, his approval ratings, you know, rose as well. He was seen to be restoring justice and, you know, pride to a humiliated nation as well. 
Other policies that the you know, like the border wall, weeding out inauthentic citizens, which I talk about in the article as well in a bit more detail, was also part of that Obama legacy in those years too. So while Biden is now talking about an, an America that is, you know, now going to recover. I think this is really problematic. And I end the article by bringing in um, the um, Young Poet Laureate's poem at the uh, inauguration, because it seems to sort of say that, you know, this is a nation that's going to heal. And, you know, but that sort of relies on a particular backstory about America, a particular narrative. And the one particular narrative that often gets excluded is it's is it somewhat darker history of, you know, well, it's a settler colonial state, um, you know, you know, the politics of the border have been crucial in shaping American identity and capital and, and capital as well. So there's a lot sort of going on there more so than shifting from an aberration back to normal politics. And that was the question I was really interested in. So that's quite a long description of, of the article. Um, no, thank you for that. So you mentioned Obama there, but do you, this type of analysis and framework, is this, you know, we were talking originally about Trump, but is it specific to Trump or can it be applied to other cases? You no, I think it can be applied to other cases. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the, um, the benefit of it because the article only really examined, for instance, just in the case of America, the lines of continuity between Trump and Obama. But there's so much more ground to cover on this if we go back further historically to see the different types of gendered bordering practices that are often at play when it comes to ideas about articulating who the nation is. And I think if we went back further in time, we would see very different variations of that, which would be really interesting to explore. And one sort of example here is like, you know, in current sort of post lockdown, still in the mode of watching a whole load of box sets, um, you know, been getting into Deadwood lately. And the fascination, fascinating sort of politics and history around the border, around the idea of the frontier there, I think we can still see remnants of that in US politics, as we can see the past sort of talking to the future when we talk about Australia or other, other states as well. So I think there's a conversation to be had there and there's lots of work that's already being done, but I think a lot of it is being done in other fields. And I think we need to have a bit more of a conversation and connection with that as well. But I think the other way in which this framework can be extended is to go beyond populism because populism is getting so much attention um, and there's so much work being done on it. Some of it is really, really excellent work. But I think we can, again, I'm sort of going back to where do we see this in terms of what we would call normal politics rather than the aberration, what is the norm and why can we make that more problematic? I think here of Australia as an example, the current, for instance, coalition government has, you know, relied on bordering practices. Um, it has basically done this in a number of different ways. It's presented security uh, bordering um, practices as a security threat. There's been a militarization of the border with Operation Sovereign Borders, which has not only brought the military into play. Uh, or a militarization of border security, but it's actually also had the effect of silencing opposition. So for instance, early on in Operation Sovereign Borders, um, reporting on what was called on water matters was banned. And then press briefings that were going to be basically delved out by the immigration um, minister and those in charge of Operation Sovereign Borders were the only source of information and they became limited as well too. Australia also changed its geography when it comes to its own border security. It excised its migration, go, migration zone, it processed um, asylum seekers offshore. And with that comes an exercise of power with our regional neighbours, uh, which can be analysed in very gendered terms and in gendered bordering terms as well. But there's also a performance of sovereignty and security, the whole idea of deterring people from coming to Australia by boat. Uh, and the fact that we process them offshore, it doesn't actually make any logical sense because on average, the figures that have recently been worked out is that we spend, Australia spends $350,000 per person held offshore per month, not per year, per month. So we are spending a great amount of money, money that can be used, for instance, for all a range of different other purposes 
to sort of present the image or the performance of security at our border. And I think this is a really interesting thing to sort of explore. At the same time as well, if you go back further, under Julia Gillard's leadership as well, her reinstatement of offshore bordering, uh, when she, she sort of brought that back in again and reopened Manus Island and now to save lives at sea, um, this was the limitation of the imagination here. This was it presented as the only solution possible in response to this problem of people coming by boat to Australia. So I think this is where we can possibly sort of really critique what sort of policy options are available to us when we examine it in this particular way. Because Gillard presented this as a way to save lives rather than the current government, which is a way to deter as well. Mm. So um, can gendered bordering as a concept, can that be extended in any way? Yeah, one of the ways I'm thinking of extending it at the moment is to think about that embodiment aspect of it, perhaps in slightly different ways, um, and also to think about how emotions might play a part in how we think about gendered ontological security and bordering practices. Ontological security is often something that is sort of felt. It relies on emotional levers to exist or to change. Um, so thinking about how, you know, we sort of feel these sort of ideas around ontological security and how they come out in very gendered forms, I think is a really interesting question. And there's some really good work that's being done in ontological security studies at the moment around embodiment as well. Um, I think there's also, you know, how bodies are presented or performed is also an interesting question here too. So, for instance, I'm thinking here about a certain aesthetic to groups like the Proud Boys, for instance. Um, you know, th there has to be sort of, I think, some element there that we can perhaps pull out and explore a bit more too. And I think also bringing emotions into the analysis provides better insights into how to think about ideas that drive this sort of politics, humiliation, pride, anger, for instance. Um, Emmy Eklund's work on this has been really fantastic. She's looked at, for instance, how um, Kavanaugh's tears during, you know, the Senate Judiciary Committee meeting in 2018 was sort of rewarded with him, you know, gaining a place on the Supreme Court. So I think there's plenty to sort of, you know, draw out of that in that way. Okay, well, thank you. Um, for those who, who might be listening to this interview who want to learn more, um, what would you say are the main takeaways from the article? I think, you know, when we're talking about, you know, the idea of the nation and how we talk about, you know, national stories and how the nation represents itself, I think we need to be, you know, I think we, as scholars, we are critical, which is, which is a good thing. But I think we also need to keep bringing that back in and sort of, not necessarily get too hung up on, I suppose, these binaries. So for instance, you know, much of the media debate around Trump and Biden or Trump and Obama is how different the two are, when in fact they share a lot of similarities. And I think the ways in which we find those similarities and find those threads is something I'd like to encourage in others, because I do think that these ideas sort of build upon and sort of cement each other they don't necessarily go away so I think we can do well to sort of explore that in a bit more detail well thank you it's been uh, it's uh, it's it's really been very interesting thank you very much for being to be for agreeing to be interviewed um I think I think uh, people listening you know I think it's a really fascinating area of research and we're uh, I'm sure people listening will be will be very grateful to you for sharing uh, your research. Um, for those of you who are keen to learn more, uh, you can see the link to uh, Chris's article at the end of the interview. Um, you can also read the full article on the first view section of the RIS um, website. If you're a BISA member, you can access this free of charge um, as part of your membership by logging into your account. Um, and if you're not a BISA member, you might want to uh, see if you can gain access via your institution. Um, and while you're here, please do look at the BISA website, www.bisa.ac.uk. Uh, you can learn all about our association and all the wonderful benefits a BISA membership will, will bring you. So please do take a look. Um, 
thanks so much, Chris. It's been it's been you know uh, it's been great to to to, to hear uh, from you. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Juliet.